Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today for this Southwest Marine Ecosystems Plastic Pollution Webinar. So my name is Dan Wilson, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Exeter as part of the Exeter Marine. And we're delighted to, to today be hosting this webinar. And so we're really lucky today to have two really inspiring speakers who are going to talk to us about some of the efforts going into tackling plastic pollution here in the Southwest region. And so before we launch into the talks, I should mention that there'll be time to ask questions at the end of each talk. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat box um, and then we can then pass that question on to the speaker. Or equally, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom and then either myself or Lauren, who's also here today um, to help out, will be able to um, let you give your, give your question to the speaker. So our first speaker today is the brilliant Hannah Beaumont. Hannah is a regular litter picker under the guise of me and the Plastic Sea and is a keen member of the Torbay Cleaner Coasts Initiative. Hannah is based in Brixham and is a support worker day to day, but the rest of her time is spent trying to make the bay that little bit cleaner. And Hannah will today be talking about some of the work of the Torbay Cleaner Coast Initiative. So yeah, over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? We all good? Yeah. Cool. Let's take it away. So this is my rubbish talk. I like the pun. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm 27. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from down here originally. I'm from Leeds in Yorkshire. I moved here in 2019 just to have a fresh start. Um, up north, I little picked a little bit. Uh, my grandma and granddad, they always did it up the Yorkshire lanes and things. So I thought I'd give it a go. But on moving down here, you really see the impacts when you are on the beaches and things every single day. And you just, for me, it's personally it's something I just couldn't just sit back and watch. So I started litter picking, as came in the plastic sea. So um, I just went out every weekend, started picking up litter. And then I thought, wait a minute, I need to show what the impact is here. Just me doing this probably isn't enough. So I set up a page on Facebook, Instagram, X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, called me and the plastic sea. Um, I have quite a good following now. Basically, I just put rubbish pictures on, put pictures of dog poo, put pictures of tampons, um, dead sea creatures. It's not a very nice page sometimes, I have to admit, but it is what it is, isn't it? If, if you don't show it, people aren't going to see it. Um, we go next minute there. So I've done a few pictures of what I found. There's obviously billions more of different things, but I've just done a few summaries. So toothbrushes, always grim. People like to flush them down the toilets. Also find new ones quite a lot from container spills. Um, I get them a lot on a certain beach near me in Brixham. I find a lot of insulin injector pumps, which have been chucked off boats, especially during COVID for some weird reason. Not sure about that. Um, cigarette butts are a big thing of mine and they're everywhere. Everyone sees them. Um, so I tend to use big plastic bottles and as I'm going around picking them so people can actually see what I'm doing and I'm not just a random person squatting on the ground, like looking for rubbish. Um, I found a plastic horse's head. So I found this in a random woodland. It's literally yay big. Don't have a clue what it is. I kept it under my bed for ages thinking, what can I do with this? Then I thought, this is really weird. So I recycled it. Um, but I wish I had it now. I'm like, oh, I should have done something out of this. But I didn't. What else did I find? I found a hospital patient band from like an inpatient and very odd. That was on a beach. And that was a recent thing. Um, I obviously didn't take a picture of that because of personal details. Um, cotton bud sticks always getting flushed down the toilet. People don't realise that thin little sticks you know, they gather up. If you go in the beach clean, you find 10, 20, 50 at a time. And that's just one beach in one part of the UK in the world. It adds up. Um, I also find a lot of fishing related things like floats. Being in Brixham, I find a lot of netting and wiring. Um, tampon applicators and pads, which is disgusting. Underwear, random bits of clothing that's obviously just being washed up from like summer days out and things like that. I find flasks and random picnic attire. Yeah, the things I find sometimes, it really just gets me. Like, I found a doormat, which I've reused. It's now my doormat, because why not? You know? Um, I also, as you see on the left here, there's a little robin, where I usually, I like to, in the summer especially, lay out everything that I find so people can actually visualise what it is instead of it just being in bags. But this little robin always usually comes along and says hello. Very, very tame and beautiful. So this is, I've just done a few little bits of what I find, just so you can see, you know, the impact. Um, this is a Kellogg's Frogman. So he's from the 1950s, and I Googled it, and it's from a US Navy frogman, and you used to put bicarbonate of soda in the actual plastic, and it would like fizzle up and down the bottoms. I found that was sticking out of some mud um, in Churston Woods near where I live. Uh, 
and it was really good. I, I did like a whole newspaper thing on it. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to be famous. And then they disappeared and never really wanted me back. That was quite sad. Um, I found a little toy Land Rover that was in St. Mary's Beach in a rock pool. And that's from the early 70s. Um, that was literally just sticking out. I saw blue and I thought, oh, plastic. Ended up digging half of the beach up. Very worthwhile, 100%. So I'm also vice chair of Torbay Cleaner Coast Initiative. Um, we set up in 2017. And our aims are to remove litter in the bay, in the beaches, the coasts, seagrass habitats and the surrounding areas. We mainly prevent and reduce marine litter pollution and the impact it has on the marine organisms and habitats. And we do this by raising awareness, supporting and promoting engagement with local marine and coastal users to reduce the overall litter. We also promote environmentally friendly and sustainable practices through community information and education opportunities wherever possible, even if it's some things like recycling. Because some people, the boxes get confusing. They're always changing what needs to be recycled and where. Some things like that are worthwhile. So we have a really small but determined and committed little steering group of around five of us. And we meet usually around monthly, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, we chat, discuss ideas plan monthly beach cleans, litter picks, have a giggle, usually eat cheese and crackers. Um, we're always looking for more members. So if anyone is local to Torbay or even further afield, like remotely, we're looking for people to help with social media, website, help filming, editing, anything like that. Because we want to grow as a group, but sometimes because we're all work full time, it's really hard to commit to certain things. But at the moment, we just do monthly beach cleans. We do them around the bay. Sometimes they can be in Torquay and Hope's Nose sometimes Brixham, and um, we try in the summer go painter and talkie and front so then if there's children involved they can go into the greenery areas and not have to be near the cliff edges things like that um, we have a really strong partnership with keep britain tidy and we work with a lot of local groups such as girl guiding schools seal project 365 sea swim and the geo park we always um, encourage the local divers to come along wherever possible to our cleans and they really help with obviously getting up the things on the seabed that we even can't see. And they always bring up a lot of fishing weights, especially near the breakwater, as you can see on the right there. We do a lot of cleans on the breakwater wherever possible. It is quite slippery on the rocks and things. So we have to do a lot of pre-planning. But when we do, even if there's only two or three people helping out, we can get five, six, seven bags just from an hour and you need to barely move a little bit up the rocks. It's just all in the little premises and things like that. In 2023, so we organized 18 cleans in total including places such as I said, Hope's Nose, which is a massive angling site. Um, it have a massive deep um, rock face to get down to a really steep hill. And a lot of people go down there, have some weekend fishing away, don't bring all the things back up. So it's all left down there. Everything you expect, obviously disgusting things. Um, this is with the local triathlon group. They contacted us and wanted to do a beach clean. And we said, hey, you're strong and fit. So let's go to Hope's Nose. Uh, and they were very willing. And as you can see there, that's all the bags they collected from just a couple of hours work. So in 2023, we removed 1,745 kilograms of marine litter, both from on land and in sea with the divers. We did bricks and breakwater, good drink turn. We did hope to a lot um, and bury head quarry as well, because that's also popular with the angling community. There's quite a lot of controversy going on there at the moment, but I'll let you read into that wherever you want to. And we recycle everything as much as possible. So when we do do litter picks, we try and do all the general rubbish in one and all the cans, bottles of plastics in the other. And one of us will take it home because we obviously want to encourage that as more and we don't want to add to landfill. We engage with all these volunteers um, and we reached over 3.6K reach on Facebook page. And our Facebook page is growing every day, which is great. We try and post everything that we do, but also everything locally that's going on in terms of geopark and things like that. And it's a really good connecting website. So this is one of our big things, which was the net recycling. We called it the net recycling gym because right at the beginning, it was just a few volunteers who would go to the harbour side in Brixton and spend a good few hours there. Um, ripping up all the nets and it was strenuous work. So I was told, I wasn't there then, but that's what I was told. So in 2018, um, we began working with the Harbour Authority and fishing community to maximise the potential for recycling used and discarded fishing nets. So over the years, the partnerships began with Keep Britain Tidy being central of that and, and Mill Speed Limited. 
So we um, enabled the fishing net to be recycled in the UK. So when we originally started, it was going all the way to Denmark and it wasn't a profitable thing. It, it just broke even, it was absolutely fine. But we wanted to obviously try and make it more sustainable. And in the end, we found Mills Speed Limited. So now it only travels 150 miles. And what they do is they clean, shred and process the nets back into pellets, which then be reused in a circular economy to recycle over and over again. So the troll nets um, from Brixham, they come now from all over the bay as much as possible. Obviously, we're limited on space and things, um, but keep Britain tidy and now we're working to get more funding to be able to continue this in other harbours around the UK because um, it's just been so successful. When we first advertised it, the fishing community were amazing. They they, they wanted to get rid of them nets, which I don't blame them for because it is an expensive thing to be doing. Um, so we took them off their hands. And so when we did our Brixham Net Gym, we had to strip back. So they usually come with metal and plastic and rubber attached to them. So it's quite a iffy job. It's quite a dangerous job, you know, um, but it was worth it because you see um, Jess there on the right. Um, she's the second person on the right. She's the chair of Tolbay Cleaner Coast. Um, and she went to the actual mill speed to see how it all worked. Um, she's done a blog post on that and you can find that on the Marine website. Very, very interesting if you want to know more. Um, but yeah, we're trying to encourage this even more now and, and keep Britain tidy are really pushing this because it's a really successful scheme. It just needs more funding and more people to want to willingly get involved. Um, alongside this, we also do the angling line recycling scheme. So around Torbay, we have angling line boxes set up in fishing shops and angling clubs. And anyone when they're finished with their lines can go and drop them in there and then they get recycled exactly the same. It's any monofilament line um, and they just have to let us know when the bin's full and we'll go and collect it all, bundle it all up and when we get enough, we'll send that off too. It's, that's, this again is a really meaningful scheme that people, when you think of when you're on the beaches and you just see the little bits of line, you think, oh, it's just a little bit of line. But when you start getting the bundles and you realise how much there actually is and how much that can be recycled and make something worthwhile, it's really, really, really good. Um, so we really encourage this as well and we would like sort of maybe other places around the bay and nationwide to take this on as well because it's, it's such an easy thing and it's 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 not hassleful or anything um but this these are used and we just have a list and so whenever anyone in our um, charity is passing we just have a look say is it been empty do you need it yeah and we'll just do that really easy really simple we're also going to hopefully try all this summer um cigarette but ballot bins try say that three times quickly um so I say um, cigarette butts are my pet peeve. And I saw these on Instagram a few years ago. So what you do when you finish with your cigarette butt, you vote and um, you can put any question you'd like in. You can change it whenever you want to. So you can vote this or that. And as you can see, the cigarette butts make the voting thing. So you can visually see what's winning. Um, we are hoping to trial three to four of these in Brixham during the summer. And we have managed to find half the funding from Torbay Council. Sorry, Brixham Town Council. Let's get them confused. Brixham Town Council. Um, we're just now looking for local businesses that will be interested to join up with us um, because we think, well, I'm not sure if anyone's walked around Brixham like every now and then, but you see the cigarette butts, especially during summer, I'm not blaming the tourists, but it's just a busier place during summer. And um, I especially hate cigarette butts. Um, so 98% of cigarette butt filters are just plastic. And I know that a lot of people, it's been said in the past, cigarettes, they don't think there's anything in them, they just think it's paper. And there's serious toxin in there, like arsenic and things, but people just don't even realise, you know, they take up to 14 years to break down sometimes, but people just think it's paper. And it's, it's not. Again, it's a noise we can sell. I'm getting passionate. <laughs> so um, during lockdown, with COVID, um, with the charity that I work for, we built a garden just to get out there when we couldn't. And it was an old abandoned wasteland. And we managed to into the garden but we whilst doing that we obviously built a lot of rubbish up and we filled five skips so I've, this is some pictures here just to show how old plastic is and it doesn't break down so as you can see this is from 1984 rebels 1987 and um, this is back to the future which is way past me 80s 80s yeah 80s um 89 87 this this packet here is like brand new really it, it's no not nothing at all I didn't even know it was a bar wall so I'm expecting it was old because I was 96 and I don't remember it so let's presume it's old um this here Tomb Raider Lucasade glass bottle and then the one on the right is I googled it 1900s that was from um that's it's a really nice glass bottle I, I love glass bottles but shouldn't be there should it um this here is from a matchbox airplane which is 
1880s. And then the one on the right is a fish paste dish, ceramic from the 1890s, which is now I use as a soap, soap container thing because I can't get rid of it, it's too nice. So I'm not sure if any litter pickers are here in the room, but um, I love finding Smarties lids. I hate them because obviously they're plastic, but I'm not sure if anyone's aware. So from the 1950s to the early 2000s, Smarties had the plastic lids on their containers before they went to the cardboard ones. And obviously litter is a lot around. So as you can see, they all have um, letters on them and then different time periods have capital letters on them and you can collect them all. So I'm trying to aim to get all the alphabet now. It's a fun thing out of litter picking. And whenever you see a Smarties lid on the beach, you get very excited and then everyone feels it's just a bit of plastic. And you're like, no, it's not. It's a Smarties lid. Um, also, this Lego. So in 1997, um, a container spilled over. Um, and they call it like Lego Lost at Sea now. And there's a, the Adrift book. And it's really interesting if you haven't read it. Um, so five million pieces of Lego washed into the sea. And every day now, it's still washing up on the beaches. There were specific like items, such as like octopus and dragons, um, I haven't found any of them yet, but I find little bits of Lego, probably not from that container ship, but all the same, still very interesting. And it's a little bit of fun out of the more mundane and boring things that you find. Also, nerdles and bio beads. If you're not on a beach regularly and you don't litter pick, it's probably something that you haven't really heard of in the science that it's they're so small. Um, if you go down on the beach and actually start looking through the sand and the stones, you will find them. They're just hidden. So Nerdles are uh, the smoother ones that you see on the left, and they're used for like pre production plastic, like the pellets are used, and they get shipped in the containers and then end up right overboard. And then the ones on the right, they're the bio beads, and they're used for like treatment of water and things, and they're always more like rigidy and a bit uh, rough. Um, but you'll find these on certain beaches, and they're thousands upon thousands, and you could be in a one meter square bit and just be picking there for hours. And, and there's a vacuum now that goes around the UK and it's like a nerdle vacuum and they use it and then like, suck them up because it's the only way, otherwise you will be there forever. And then the tide will come in and there'll be more, unfortunately. It's, it's yeah. So another plastic thing of mine is dog poo bags. So a few years ago, I started walking a certain loop around Brixham to paint in the back. And I noticed the amount of dog poo bags that were hanging from trees. So I started collecting them. And now it came an obsession. And now I'm obsessed with dog food bags. It's disgusting. So once a month I go on this walk and I count up the number of dog food bags that I pick up as long as, um, as well as other general rubbish, I pick up the dog food bags. So in the last two years, I've collected 1,274 dog food bags from a three to four mile loop. Um, in 2022, it was 648. And in 23, it was 626. So it's only gone down barely, nothing. Um, I'm doing it still now. It's just, I don't understand it. And it's something that people always ask me, why do people do it? I don't know. And then people always say, oh, they should just never even pick it up, just leave it. And then I go, no, that's not the point because then the poo gets into the sea and then there's all the toxins. I'll never know why, it annoys me. Uh, pictures, have some poo pictures. <laughs> so that's all I've got to say about plastic, poo and everything in between. Uh, thank you very much for putting up with me. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really interesting. I certainly feel uh, even more inspired now. And you're, de you're definitely right about Smarties lids. I've got at least a couple of those hiding around in cupboards. <laughs> Bits of Lego. So there's a few different questions in the chat already. If anyone else has any questions or thoughts they'd like to put in the chat and we can read them out for um, for Hannah. And also, Lauren, if you want to jump in, if there's anyone with their hands up. So I just get the chat box open here. Um, so Jill has said we found find all the same stuff on Exmouth, although apart from the horse's head. Um, and then there's someone, um, Sophie has said, how can we get involved? And they're from Exeter. Um, so we have a very active Facebook page. At the moment, we're in the means of getting a website set up. We're just taking a bit, but we do have a Facebook page. So messages on there. There should be an email address on there too. Um, I'll get back in touch on Jess and we'll go from there. Thank you. Awesome. Perhaps you can put a link to the Facebook page in the chat if you get the yes, chance to something today. Definitely. Um, we've also got a question from Bill, who's asked if you're a member of a member of Surfers Against Sewage. I am not, but I soon shall be. Yes, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, and then there's a question from Alexandra, who asks, "Do you know where KBT gets the funding for fishing gear recycling?" I don't. I know that I think the original bit came from the government central government. Um, I'm not sure where the continuous funding is coming from. Um, the guy who does it is called Neil. 
um, if you he has a set email address which I can find and post out to people um, I'm sure he'll be really interested to speak to people about that awesome um, and Lauren I think do we have a question there yeah um, Andy I'm just gonna unmute you if I can Can I ask a question, Hannah? Oh, for me. Sorry, thank you. Um, great presentation. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, it's great to see you, you work um, the the network. Um, there's huge amounts of, of sort of waste plastic effectively being um, repurposed in whichever way it can be. Um, and working with the fishing industry, always very important, you know, community, et cetera. Um, also, I really like when you do your own um, litter picking and, and and you put out the rubbish, you know, and take photos of it out. It is so much more important doing that than just putting it in a bag. If we all carry on and do beach cleans, litter picks, and you pick and you bag and you bin, you don't know what's there. You know, we all do our own individual picks and we just don't know what, what the problems really are. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a thing to say about the, the dog poo uh, bags you could take that a lot further. If you've got a specific route that you do, start mapping where you're finding them, how many you find where. You can then begin to look at specific dog walkers and where they're interacting with the dog poo bags. And maybe, maybe just find a source of where they are coming from. Um, and the last thing I'm just going to ask is, do you record your what, you're, what you find um, on the, the regular sort of surveying um, protocols from the Marine Conservation Society and Break Free from Plastic? Um, I do sometimes, yes. Um, we do, as t TCCI topically, of course, we do do everything we can do. Me, I'm probably a bit lack on that sometimes, work gets in the way. Um, but I, that is one of my things this year is to try and contribute more to things like that because I know how important it is. Brilliant, yeah. I mean, for, for us, I mean, I... I, I I've been out in the southwest a fair bit, but we strandliners are over in the um, south southeast. But all, we we only participate in surveys now because it's really trying to stop it all at source. Mm. But brilliant, well done. Thank you. Um, and I'll pass it back to you. So there's a few more in the chat. Perfect. So we've got uh, Natalie said brilliant talk. Um, she asks. Can bits of fishing line be found on beaches or to be added into the recycling bins? Yes, they can. As long as they're clean um, and nothing else attached to them, of course, definitely. Ah, oh, brilliant. And then Jill asks, do you know where the fishing bins come from? Is that something you make yourselves or is that something you order in? Um, so we made them ourselves out of old buckets and bins and things like that. And we can always replace them. Just simple bucket with as long as it's got a closed lid on it. Awesome. Um, and so Jill also says, um, oh my Hannah, plastic free Exmouth are also on with the butt bins. So many uh, cigarette butts about and it's their main priority. I love the idea of the uh, the vote about which one, which way to go. Um, and then Katie Nash uh, says that her local beach in Whitsand Bay is also full of these bio beads and it's a really sad sight. And so I will just cheekily tag on a question to the end of that, if you don't mind. So do you know if there's any local sources for these bio beads near where you're finding them. So I think Southwest Water Plants, some types of plants use them, I think, don't they? Yeah, yeah. We haven't worked out the actual source yet. So locally, we find them a lot on um, Broadsands and Goodrington. They're the two brains because it's in the middle of the bay. They're where it gets swept into. Um, we haven't found a source yet. Funnily enough, on St Mary's Beach in Brixham, it's not nurdles or bio beads, but we regularly find um, a square tiny, tiny, um, plastic, um, purple square, and they're everywhere. I've got a load in my room. Um, yeah, I keep on the plastic in my room, don't ask. Um, <laughs> but we, we find them all the time on that one beach, and we've even had like newspaper coverage in the past, um, years ago, but we can't find out where they're coming from either, and we're wondering if it's something to do with the water. Yeah, I suggest maybe there's like a local source, doesn't it? Mm. And then we've also got Natalie and Jenny have both said, thank you for a great talk, and they're feeling inspired. Um, Tom from BDMLR said that he totally agrees on taking pictures from beach cleans and it's great to post these on local community pages in order to reach a wider audience to open eyes about the scale of the issue and also gain more, more volunteers as well, hopefully. Um, and so I had a quest another question as well. I wondered if you've seen trends since you started beach cleaning. So maybe in the pandemic, did you see whether 
did you start finding lots of kind of pandemic related waste with kind of single use masks and that type of thing and yeah so during the um covid i was still working but i had a lot of free time so i went on a lot of beach cleans um found so many masks they were everywhere every few steps even not on the beach just around town everywhere and gloves so many gloves I even find now on beaches washed up COVID tests all the time, you know, the parts of the plastic, they're still they're still there. Um, I think they always will be, unfortunately, now, because they got flushed down the toilet for some reason. Yeah. Oh, and then one final thing's coming from Helen. There's most local recycling schemes don't recycle nylon. Um, so it's always always good to check where you put it in before recycling. Um, but she says that it's best to take it to a net recycling scheme. Um, and apparently Odyssey Innovation can be contacted about this kind of thing. Yes, they're great. Um, they Anything about that, they are the people to go to. Definitely recommend them. Awesome. So I think now we'll move on. So thank you very much for an absolutely brilliant talk there, Hannah, and answering so many great questions. And so we'll now move on to our second speaker. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce today our second speaker, who is Claire Geiner. And so Claire is the head of inspiration and impact at the Two Minute Foundation, which I'm sure you'll agree is an absolutely brilliant job title. And Claire spends <laughs> most of her days trawling the beaches around around where she lives and will today be talking about the work of the two minute beach clean of the two minute foundation hi there guys thank you and thank you hannah for such a lovely talk preceding my one and um, i'm sure that a lot of you are going to see similar themes in um my talk as well so i will make sure that i don't go too much into the same detail but for example i'm also obsessed with nurdles so i was going to talk to you a little bit about nurdles but we'll move on and we'll brush past that quite quickly. So I'm just going to share my screen, bear with me, let's hope that it works. All right, has everybody got my screen? Can we get a thumbs up for someone? Yeah, brilliant, perfect, thank you. Okay, so yes, we are the Two Minute Foundation and it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you all a little bit about who we are. So we are a national charity. Uh, our vision is to live in a world without litter and plastic pollution, where nature thrives. Uh, and we encourage everybody to clean up our planet two minutes at a time. Now, you may well have heard of our very first campaign, which was the Two Minute Beach Clean, which started a very, very long time ago. Um, and that's kind of where we started our existence. Um, and what was an idea back then is now, like I say, a national charity. So our HQ, our base is here in Bude in North Cornwall, and that's where I live. Uh, so most of my days are based here in the southwest, but we do also go around other parts of the country as well. So where did we start? So back in 2013, we had some really, really bad storms and the beaches were completely littered with plastic. And what happened was a, a local guy here, a guy called Martin Dory, he went out for a surf, had a great surf, had some nice waves, came back into the beach and the beach was just littered with plastic bottles. And he kind of went to himself, you know what, this is, this is not OK, like we need to do something about this. At this point, he wasn't an environmentalist in any way, shape or form. He was, in fact, an author and a TV presenter. So he had a bit of a following on Twitter. He went onto his Twitter account and said, guys, this is awful. There's so much plastic on the beach. I just wanted to go for a surf. But actually, I'm going to do a two minute beach clean. And he used the hashtag two minute beach clean for the very first time. And it just exploded from there. And this idea of doing a two minute beach clean and it making a difference was just it, it just caught people's imagination and they loved it and they rolled with it. And what started as just that one idea and that one hashtag is now a massive global movement, which is super exciting. Social media really was the way that we managed to get that message out there from day one. And it's still our bread and butter. It's still a brilliant way, as you were discussing earlier, that actually taking photos of what you're doing and sharing them widely is a great way of engaging and raising awareness to people that maybe don't see the litter on the beaches and the streets every day. And what we found is within our social media communities, actual communities galvanized and came together and started doing stuff together in their local patches, uh, which is brilliant because, you know, it's all very well going out on your own and doing a beach clean and doing your two minutes, but actually sometimes you want someone to do it with. And what we've managed to create on our social community, I guess, is a family of 100,000 people that go out and do it every single day and talk to each other every single day and make good friends with other people that are doing the same thing. It really does go to show that you're not alone, even though you're doing your beach cleans on your own. So as I say, we've got a global reach and it's really exciting. If you're intrigued, then do go on to Instagram and search the hashtag of Two Minute Beach Clean and you will see just how far 
the, the thing has gone. So we have people doing beach cleans in Antarctica. We have them in Australia. We have them at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, and the top of Everest. We've got the hashtag two minute beach clean from every corner of the globe. And it's really, really exciting because we know it's a global problem. So although we're very active locally, as are all of you guys, I'm sure, it's really nice to see that the message is spreading. So that's where we started 10 years ago from that one little idea. We've now got the stations network. You've probably seen these, our little wooden A-frames that live on the beaches. There's 1,400 of them around the UK now. You can't really visit a beach or a green space without falling over one, uh, which is brilliant because even though the litter pickers get stolen and broken and the bags get used and popped in a bin, they're still there as an educational thing, saying to someone when they get to the beach, have you done your beach clean? It's bringing that kind of normalization of beach cleaning and the fact that the beaches need cleaning into our natural kind of lifestyle. So not only are they at the beaches, we've also got the litter pick stations that are inland in the green spaces, uh, the parks and the rivers and the lakes, because we know that 80% of the ocean bound plastic starts its life on land. So if we can stop it at source inland, then it's better than trying to pick it up off the beaches. However, it's a harder win which is why it's still beach cleaning is the number one thing, because it's much more romantic to go for a nice stroll along the beach and pick up some litter than it is to go in the back beyond of city centre and pick up someone's greasy McDonald's wrappers. So we've got the Two Minute Beach School, which is our kind of educational arm, and that's based here in Bude. And we have people that come to us all year long. We have regular sessions. We do sessions with schools. We do sessions with businesses. Everything we offer is free because we're completely funded for our beach school, which is super exciting, which means there is nobody that can't come to us and learn about how awesome our coastlines are and how to protect them. We do social media campaigns. We've got a really fun challenge coming up in April about repurposing, which is a great one. We do some tours. So we go out once or twice a year for about a month and we visit other areas. So like I say, we're based in the southwest. We know the southwest like the back of our hands and there's loads of stuff going on here. It's not necessarily the case for the rest of the country. So it's really important that we take our learnings from here and take them elsewhere and sort of start the ball rolling in lots of other places. We've got the Reaching Communities Project, which is a national lottery funded project. We're two and a half years to go on that one, which is all about galvanizing communities that are doing great work. And in fact, I worked with Hannah just last month in Tor Bay. We were there for a weekend, did loads of stuff together and uh, sort of tried to support community groups because we're a charity, which means we're employed and really grateful and fortunate to be in the position where we do this all day long. But those community groups, those of you that are doing voluntarily, sometimes you need a helping hand in someone to just get a bit of admin done or get a bit of press done or whatever it might be. And that's how we want to support those communities. Okay, so our campaigns, as I mentioned, Two Minute Beach Clean, number one campaign. Two minute litter pick is it's you know it's catching up. People are starting to really embrace litter picking in their green and blue space, uh, green spaces, not just the blue spaces, which is great. The two minute solution campaign. This is all about other simple things that people can do that are quick and easy that add up to make a big difference. Things like you know remembering a reusable bottle, a really simple one to harder ones or maybe a bit more advanced ones, things like, you know, making sure that you're paying into an ethical pension pot, which actually only takes a minute to make a switch. Using an ethical bank doesn't take very long to make a switch, doesn't cost you any money, but it saves the world. So lots of solutions like that. And two minutes of positivity. Now this was born out of COVID and the lockdowns and suddenly loads of our online community were getting in touch and saying I can't get to my beach I'm not allowed to walk I'm not allowed to drive I'm not allowed to be outside I'm not allowed to I can't even remember those restrictions they were bonkers hey like I can't it seems like such a bizarre time but you're only allowed outside for a certain amount of time and a certain duration uh, anyway so people weren't able to go out and do their beach cleans and litter picks and they were tearing their hair out so we started this campaign which was all around other ways that we can do planet positive things or feel the benefits of the planet. Um, and we kind of thought it would be put to bed after COVID, but it was so popular that we've carried it on. And it's all about celebrating the small wins, finding the positives, because we are winning this fight. There's a lot to be positive about, even though it feels really overwhelming at times. So that kind of led us into thinking, why are people really missing doing their beach cleans and litter pits during COVID? And we looked into some research around it, but basically, beach cleaning, 
releases all four of your happy hormones in just two minutes. If you do a two minute beach clean, you have four happy hormone hits. There's not many activities out there that do that. So although you might think, I, what do I like beach cleaning a little bit? Like, what, what is it? Like, I always feel great afterwards. Like, it's that's a fact. There are four happy hormones and all four get released when you do a two minute beach clean. So you get your endorphins from doing exercising. That doesn't mean running a marathon. It means walking, bending, stretching, lifting. That's all endorphin creating. You get dopamine from completing a task. So that's when you say, right, I'm going to do a beach clean for two minutes. Once your two minutes is done, you get that little of dopamine and celebrating small wins. Like, yes, I did it. I did my two minutes. Great. Serotonin you get from walking in nature and from sunshine, that kind of self-explanatory, doing a beach clean or a little bit. And you get your oxytocin from doing an altruistic or a selfless act. So that's something that benefits other people or other things. So by picking up a crisp packet, you're benefiting the planet. So you get that little hit straight away. And meditation, that's another one, which is an interesting thing. I could talk for years about this and I won't. But a lot of people, when they beach clean, they find it really meditative. Um, and it's because you're focused on such a small thing. Um, and anyway, once once you get into that zone of zoning out the rest of the world, you're just litter picking, you get your oxytocin too. So just doing a two minute beach clean or litter pick every day gives you those four happy hormones. And it's really important that we have those happy men moments in a day that is crazy and busy. So what are we picking up now very briefly, because I know Hannah spoke really well about the things that we're finding, but I just wanted to talk to you about a, a common misconception. So those of us that do beach cleans and litter picks, I tend to get a lot of resistance if I ask somebody to do a litter pick or a beach clean, for example, okay, hang on, let me take that back. I'm gonna paint a picture. So we do a lot of things with businesses. They might come to us for a day, we take them all out, take their staff out, do some learning, do some beach cleaning, la la la. When they get there, they were like, oh, I don't want to do a beach clean. I don't want to pick up other people's mess. Like they're just lazy. Blah, blah, blah. You get a real attitude about um, picking up people's mess because there's a real kind of people think that, you know, if a family had come to the beach for the day and they just left all their rubbish behind and they've walked away, then why should I go and pick that up? And of course, that is true. However, what we're picking up is not picnic waste. Yes, of course it is to some degree. There's occasionally a family that are left behind their crisp packets, but actually what we're getting in vast majority is the ocean plastics. This is the stuff that has started its journey in the oceans and the currents, the waves, the wind are blowing it onto the beaches. And that stuff has come from goodness knows where. Yes, it could have come from, I know, Joe Bloggs, who's sat next to you, who just threw his crisp packet on the floor, but also it could have come from another country. It could have come from... 20 years ago. I mean, who's to say that a little pink hairbrush that I've just picked up from the beach didn't come from my bin when I was five years old? There's no way of knowing where that stuff has come from. And that kind of makes it everybody's responsibility to deal with it because it's nobody's responsibility. But I guarantee that in our lives, we have contributed to it. Because even if we put something in the bin when we were five or six or 10, or even a year ago, there's no guarantee that that didn't end up in the oceans. Yes, we like to think once something has gone into the bin, it goes to landfill and it gets dealt with and sorted and it's, it's away. There is no such thing as a way. There is many opportunities for that item to then end up back in the environment. So I think there's it's something to be very mindful of when you're talking to people about beach cleaning and litter picking that aren't familiar with it. The first thing to make them aware of is that actually what we're not doing is picking up after people's mess. Yes, we are sometimes, but that's not the majority of what we're picking up. And these are three lovely facts that I like to wheel out when anyone says anything about plastics or beach cleans or litter picks or recycling or whatever. These are three great things that I think everybody should just know. Anyone and everyone should know this, that plastic never breaks down. You hear all these stories about, oh, you know, this plastic bag is going to take 50 years to degrade. This plastic bottle is going to take 500 years to break down, blah, blah, blah. That's completely not true. Plastic cannot break down. What it does is it breaks up does the opposite. It breaks up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And as Hannah was explaining, they become microplastics. Uh, and then even past microplastics, they become nanoplastics. That's what's then atmospheric that we're then breathing in, eating in, drinking in, etc. Plastic never breaks down. It was a marketing ploy 
from the 70s that some big oil company came up with and people ran with it. And it's not true. Plastic never breaks down. It will never go away. It will always exist in some form. The next fact is that enough plastic already exists to never need to use a virgin material. As Hannah said, we've got nurdles. Little nurdles. Here's my jar of nurdles. These are the raw plastic pellets that are used to create all plastic products. We don't need to use these raw plastic pellets ever again if we could recover everything that already exists that's not used anymore. And the third thing is that recycling is not the answer. Again, this is a common thing we get like, oh, yes, I've got a plastic bottle of Coke here, but it's OK because I can recycle it. Recycling is not an infinite solution. You can only recycle something at most seven times before it's then useless. On average, it gets recycled three times before it's so useless it can't be used again. And the recycling system in the UK is not good. It is a broken system. It's an antiquated system that can't quite cope with what we're using. Recycling is a good step in the right direction, but it's not the answer and it doesn't justify using plastic. OK, I'm not going to talk about this anymore because Hannah really did, but I do love nurdles. I'm obsessed. If you want to know anything more about them, just let me know. These are our litter pick stations in case you haven't seen them. As I mentioned, we've got the ones on the left there. They are made from uh, ocean plastics that we found on the beaches. So we went around here, collected half a ton of plastic and made 50 stations with them, which is really cool. And you can see all the different materials in there. And then you've got the ones on the right that are our classic stations that you see everywhere. So this is two minute solution. Here's just a few of them. As I mentioned, some of them are easier. Some of them are um, a bit more uh, challenging and demanding, but that gives you a rough idea of some of the solutions that we encourage everybody to take. I mean, we've got 52 that we kind of recycle, but uh, there's a few. So as I mentioned, our beach school base here in Bude is super fun and it's a brilliant way of getting people to fall in love with our coastlines. Now, if you think about anything in life that needs protecting, you only protect what you love. There's a reason that people donate to protect the polar bears or the pandas or the elephants. And there's a reason that nobody is giving their money to donate to protecting the dung beetle or, uh, I don't know, some kind of hideous looking spider, for example. You protect what you love and you, uh, you learn to love something when you learn about it. So by getting people out on the beaches all day, every day, they're seeing the beaches, they're seeing the coastline, they're seeing the destruction they're seeing the climate changing, they're seeing all of those things and they're learning to protect it and they're wanting to protect it, which is great. So what can you do? These are just a few things that everybody can do. You can find the positives. Now, as I said, it's a super overwhelming time to be in the environmental sphere. There is a lot of doom and gloom, but you are not alone and we are winning this fight. So find those positives. Learn and explore. This is a really important one. If you do nothing else this week that supports the environment or supports anything, just spend two minutes Googling something. Anything that you might have heard today from Hannah or myself that you've been intrigued by or that you would like to know more about, go and look at it. Go and learn it and expand our minds. And once we've learned something, pass it on to somebody else as well. Tell them about it. Maybe go and, you know, if nurdles, for example, has been a new word for you today, just spend two minutes after this meeting Googling a little bit more about nurdles and their, their production. Um, and then at dinner tonight, tell your other half, tell your kids, tell your parents, whoever you're going to have dinner with. Doing a beach clean or litter pick, obviously, goes without saying, do one of those if you can. And embrace your green and blue spaces. They are so good to us. So we need to be good to them. And take on one two-minute solution. I've mentioned a few here today, but we've got hundreds over on our socials if you are intrigued. So... Can two minutes really make a difference? Now, this is by far the most popular question I get asked. So the whole idea of two minute foundation is that it equates to a small amount of time. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go and do a two minute beach clean and it must last only 120 seconds, but two minutes is, it's the intent. It's used to represent a short amount of time, a small amount of effort, a little bit of your attention, and it's unintimidating, it's not a big commitment, and it's achievable. And that's really, really important. Now, we know the power of, of collective action and community. So on your own, yes, one person's two-minute beach clean or one person's two-minute litter pick isn't going to change the world or have even a really big impact. But there's a whole, as a community, 
those two minutes add up to make a massive difference. I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. So this is not related to litter picking, but it helps you to understand what I'm trying to say here. If you, uh, let's say walking, okay, if you walk for two minutes today, you'd walk 200 meters. If you walked two minutes every week, it would take you about four years to walk a marathon, okay? If you walk for two minutes every day, it would take just three weeks to walk a marathon. But if we all of us in England, just England, if we all walked for two minutes, we would collectively have walked to the moon and back 14 times. So if you do it yourself, you're walking 200 meters. If everybody did it, we'd walk to the moon and back 14 times. That's insane. There's another example here about books, okay? If you read a book for two minutes, you might read a couple of pages. If you read a book for two minutes every week, it takes six years to complete the average book. If you read for two minutes every day, you'd complete the same book in under a year. But if everybody in the world read for two minutes a day, it would only take two days to read every single book written ever. So, you know, you could read two pages, but if everybody did it, by tomorrow, we'd have read every single book ever written. It's insane. That is how powerful community is. And if we're all doing it, if you're contributing your two minutes to that, that is what you are impacting, which is really exciting. So we know, well, I, I mean, I think I mentioned to you that 80% of the plastic that we find on the beaches starts in land. So two minutes is enough to make a change. You get to choose what you're doing with your litter. You get to choose what you're buying. You get to choose what you're using, what you're consuming. And that's going to stop what we're finding at the beaches. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got my email address, name, et cetera, phone number on there. So do get in touch with me for anything else that you want. We love to hear from you. Um, and if there's one takeaway from this, I just want you to really understand how important all of your individual actions are. And uh, thank you for being a part of the wonderful environmental community that we're all a part of. So I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to Dan. Thank you so much for that brilliant talk. I certainly feel inspired and I have to admit I'm definitely going to steal the analogy about the book about the, the world's books. That is an absolutely brilliant analogy. I did have one question. Have you ever tried to work out what that accounts to in terms of like the number of hash, like number of two minute hashtags and how many like goodness knows how many hours have come out of all the kind of two minute hashtags? Yeah, yeah. So we last year alone we had two hundred thousand hashtags on Instagram. Um so I mean I guess that's four hundred thousand minutes if everyone only does two minutes. Um, but it's a it's quite an I hate the word nebulous, but it is quite a nebulous figure figure because obviously I do a beach clean every day, but I can't remember the last time I actually posted about it on Instagram because, because we don't, do we? I think that's the problem with sort of everyday litter pickers. Um maybe we don't uh, advertise it as much as we should be. But yeah, there's a lot of people out there doing their two minutes, which is really, really cool. Brilliant. And so we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So if anyone else has any questions that they'd like to, if they like to raise their hand and, and, and Lauren can can let you answer the question. But we've got a couple in the chat here. So Alexandra um, mentioned about the waste coming from the land-based source, which I think leans into kind of what you were saying about the kind of collective responsibility in terms of everyone. Um, it's, even if it had, that kind of bit of plastic hasn't been you at that time, at some point in the past, kind of that collective responsibility. Um, Alicia said, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, she says that she didn't get very well when you said that recycling is not always the answer. If we don't recycle, what do we do with all the plastic that's on the planet? Oh, my God, the million dollar question. Um, so basically, we need to be using less plastic. That is the answer. Recycling is a good and OK alternative for the plastics that we do need to use. But what we need to be thinking of is not throwing something away in the first place. So if you have used a, I don't even know, if you need a drink, try not to buy one in a plastic bottle, try and buy a can because can or tin recycling is infinitely recyclable. Glass recycling is infinitely recyclable. Plastic recycling, as I say, can only be done a maximum of seven times because what happens is every time something gets recycled, the polymers get broken down and it's like anything, it gets worn out over time and ends up being so, almost not being held together anymore. 
And you'll have seen in the in Sainsbury's or Morrison's or Tesco's, anytime you get sort of the black plastic trays, which often meat comes in, for example, black plastic is the lowest grade of plastic. So that is on its last legs. When it's black plastic, it can no longer be used for any other purpose. So that sort of shows you the sort of the life cycle of the recycling system. Um, but yes, the, it's hard to say what to do with all the plastic on the planet. What we can be doing is reusing it. So for example, if I get my little nerve jar here, I've got this pink lid, this is plastic. If I to put that into the recycling, it will get used three or four times before it then ends up in the bin. But if this could get re-shredded, so it would go to a plant, get shredded back down into new, essentially new nurdles that could then get reused, remolded and put into a new product, then that product could last for another 50 years. So we need to be finding ways to recover old plastic and turn it into new stuff that will last for a long time. We need to be relying less on single use items that just get thrown into the recycling. Hope that helps. It's a really, that's, yeah, that wasn't a great answer. No, I think that's a good answer, definitely. I think, think Lauren, do we have a question from for the hand up? Um, another question from Andy, so I'll just unmute you again, Andy. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Claire. Great positiveness. And th that is so important with everything. It just encourages, engages, etc. So brilliant. Um, just briefly on the recycling thing, it's the only system that we have that is actually, you know, it's a national recycle, you know, nationally, uh, it's all we have to work with. So we've got to make it work as much as possible. But I think from where we come from, Strandlines come from, it's not really doing the job. So we, we really mm -hmm. have to think about other, um, other ways, you know, reduce, et cetera, as you were saying, um, do the, does the, um, do you, get involved with much recording of items that so you know taking part in the um the marine conservation society survey i mean they've been surveying plastic pollution since 1994 so yeah and, and then and now there's you know break free from plastic are doing it in similar ways so do you do you take part in those and if you do how how do you and and are you able to um sort of use that data that you're collecting because it's all about collecting data in the end um how, have you been able to use any of that that data on sort of in lo on local issues at all yeah actually we have yeah it's a really good point and you're right to say that data is vital data is vital toward making change and if organizations like mcf has have mcs have the full picture they can make really informed um recommendations to governments and to lobbying stuff. So yes, data is vital. Now, we actually used to have our own app. We actually closed the app down in December of last year. So only three or four months ago. So we've had this app for six years, six, seven, seven years. And we encouraged everybody when they were doing their tomb and beach clean to upload their data onto our app. So what happened was at the time when we started our um, data collection app, we were one of the only people doing it. However, the space has changed a lot in the last six years. And we started to find that actually there was like seven or eight different charities all collecting data, which doesn't make sense. So we gave all of our data to MCS. Um, so that there's sort of one source because it doesn't make sense for people to have to be uploading it multiple times. And we are all working together. We work really closely with MCS and with loads of other charities because we're all working for the same purpose. Um, so. We don't, we don't ask people to uh, log their data daily, but we do uh, massively encourage people to do the KBT spring beach cleans. We do the MCS beach cleans in September. Uh, we run them ourselves here in Bude for anyone that wants to come along and do them with us as well. Um, but we absolutely shout about those that are data collecting and encourage everybody to do it. But what we don't want to be doing is splitting people's efforts because that just doesn't make any sense. Um, but yeah. I, we completely agree that data is the way forward. It's going to be the way that we can make actual change. Can I just say that that's brilliant, excellent. Um, and I mean, the, the thing about all collecting the same data is standardized methodology. So you can compare, you can, yeah. et cetera. So brilliant, absolutely well done. Um, just out of interest with the keep, does um, the Keep Britain Tidy, do they collect data of anything else more than just weight and bags? 
Um, so they do on their, uh, Hannah might be able to actually answer this better than me because her group is actually a KBT group, but their monthly beach cleans, they just do weight and bags, but they do the Great British Spring Clean, which is more than weight and bags. I believe it's items. But Hannah, I might call Hannah into or somebody else. I will, I can put a link in here about what they do, but they do one yearly one, which is proper data. And again, they work with MCS so that we're all using the same methodology in the same categories because that's the most important part but categories of course are always changing because you know 10 years ago when we were doing this there wasn't a category for face masks and as Hannah said we find make face masks all the time now so there's new categories always being added brilliant thanks very much for the question there Andy and the answer there Claire um, so there's a couple more um points stuff in the chat so Jenny said thank you for the great talk and brilliant analogies um and Jill has said, superb, thank you very much. Natalie also has a question. There's amazing talk, thank you very much. She says she's been following Two Minutes for a number of years and finds it really inspiring. Do you have any book recommendations as they really loved Martin's first book? Oh, cool. Yeah, Martin's books are great, aren't they? Uh, so he's got a series of them now, but he's also got a series of kids ones. So if you've got kids in your life, there's Kids Fight, kids fight Plastic, Kids Fight Climate Change, Kids Fight Extinction, and I believe the next one is Kids Fight Deforestation. Don't quote me on that. Um, that's coming soon. But yeah, so he's got a range of kids books and the range of the adult books. So there's the um, rub No More Rubbish Excuses and um, a few others. Um, other books, there, you know, there's just so many now. Um, the market is really, really uh, good, I think. Um, I would always recommend Martin's though, of course. <laughs> Brilliant. I think that's all the questions from the chat and also from people that have the hands up. So I think just to, oh, hang on, we've got one last, we might have time for one last question here. Um, so when litter picking nurdles and bio beads, is it best to dispose of them through landfill or do you know if they can be recycled somehow? Yeah, no, this is a really um, contentious one, actually. So nurdles, um, once a nurdle has been in the water, in the sea, so, you know, they're pretty tiny, right? Here's a nurdle. Once a nurdle has been in the ocean for just 24 hours, it has enough algae on it to then smell like fish food. So if it's got that much algae on it, it can't be recycled. They need to be clean to be recycled. So what I would suggest you do with nurdles, you've probably got a local group in your area that would really like them. So, for example, we get through billions of nurdles because we use them as an educational tool. Uh, I, know, I know Hannah would be the same until the coast is clear down there. Uh, sorry, until the coast is clear down there. Also use them. Loads of organisations want your nurdles. So reach out to your local community group and see if it would be helpful for them. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, they just have to go into the black bin, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a brilliant example. I think almost every beach clean must have a little jam jar or spice jar yeah. somewhere, slowly filling up the nurdles over time. Definitely. Yeah. And they're so helpful, you know, when we do school visits, for example, making artwork with nurdles, like they're such a great reminder for people. So, yeah, we love receiving nurdles. And I know that most other groups would be the same. Brilliant. Also, so um, Penelope just said, thank you very much for book recommendations. He'll buy them for their nieces. Yay. Um, and then also Andy's put in the chat about Feeder organising the great nurdle hunt. Um, yeah, as a chance to collecting data and recording evidence to lobby for change, and I think that's another one where there's been, I think there's been nurdles, nurdle cleans done in Antarctica and the Arctic, yeah. and every, pretty much everywhere in between. Yeah, absolutely, and they've been going for years as well, so they've got a really good data set now. So yeah, do that one as well. I mean, if you're never sure, if you're unsure of what you should be doing, lots of people talk about them. But on our socials, we do make sure that we shout out to those other organisations as a reminder, like all oh, the nurdle hunts coming up. But at the moment, it's the big plastic count. So if you're not doing the big plastic count, you should be. Uh, and you, if you want to head to our socials, there's some information about it there. But yeah, there's so much going on and so many bits of citizen science that you guys can get involved with. Definitely. And Natalie's put in the chat that they collect their nurdles in a jam jar that they've got on their coffee table, which are always used as a good talking point for friends when they come yes. over. Excellent. Love that. I think now it's probably just about time to wrap up. So I'd like to take a moment to thank both Claire and Hannah for their absolutely brilliant talks. I'm feeling super inspired now. I'm looking forward to getting out to the beach and hopefully some of you out there are feeling inspired as well. And so I'd also like to thank Lauren as well, who's been working tirelessly behind the scenes um, to make sure the Zoom links all work correctly and make sure the webinars advertised. And so it's 
One thing that I did want to shout out as well is it's soon time to start putting together the 2023, so the annual report for last year. And so we've got some great organisations that, re that we reach out to that collect data. But I want to add a bit into this year's report where we shout about some of the awesome work that's happening in the Southwest that volunteers are doing. So if you've got any great, um, great beach clean news stories or any photos or anything like that that you can send in that we could include in our report, please do send them in. And I'll put my email in the chat at the end just so that if anyone does have any good news stories, they can send it in and then we can compile that in the report. Because I some think sometimes it's easy to forget about all the amazing volunteer work that does go on in the Southwest and the huge amounts of plastics and that are removed from the environment. So definitely like to shout about that. And talking of the conference, you can also buy conference tickets now. They're available on the Southwest Marine Ecosystems webinar website. So that's all from me. So thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, and yes, hopefully you leave inspired. And thanks again to our speakers, Lauren, and also Vizara for helping organize.